lot of pressure on the financial service industry right now and on financial advisors between a growing regulatory burden, competition from the banks and robo-firms, not to mention an uncertain economy. It's not an easy time to be an independent, but here's what I believe. Independent advice is more valuable today than it's ever been. There is no algorithm that can replace the human interaction, as we just learned earlier. And study after study backs this up. The ways that consumers seek out information may have changed, but at the end of the day, there is nothing that re can replace a trusted advisor who's in it through the long haul, through all of life's ups and downs. As an independent advisors, we need a strong voice to make sure that our way of doing business is protected and our voices are heard. We can't afford to go it alone in this environment. If you're an independent advisor, I urge you to stand with me and all my fellow board members in support of an industry that has served us all well. Access to advice is an important cornerstone of consumer protection and we need to stand firm in protecting choices for our clients. If you're already a member, I thank you for your support and I invite you to take the opportunity to renew your membership by stopping by our table today. If IFB membership, uh, IFB membership connects you with other independent advisors, it gives you the tools you need to understand and navigate the regulatory environment and make a compliant practice and maintain a compliant practice. Whether you're looking to grow, maintain, or wind down your practice, the IFB membership that you have connects you with a community of like-minded financial professionals through our succession and continue continuity planning platform called Coming Up Next. And I'm excited to tell you that as of now, Coming Up Next is available at no extra charge for all IFB members. Now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who's actually going to introduce our next speaker. <laughs> Mark Johns. Mark Johns is the president of, uh, he's the vice president of International Employee Benefits with Special Risk Insurance Managers Limited. He has distinguished himself through 30 plus years of experience working with large national insurance firms in Ontario and Atlantic Canada. His insurance career has connected uh, or concentrated, is concentrated within the special risk area, meeting unique needs of clients domestically and internationally. So Mark, please introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much. I'm Mark Johns with Special Risk Insurance Managers and um, we're a uh, independent MGA with offices across Canada. And uh, through my division, it's International Employee Benefits. Welcome you to drop by our booth so we can talk a little bit about some of the solutions we have. And one of the products that we do offer is kidnap and ransom insurance. In fact, I have somebody in the trunk right now. <laughs> He's complaining about the coal, but never mind. Uh, and our, our underwriter uh, market for that is CFC Insurance, uh, based in London, England. And I have the pleasure of having Mark Baker, who is the team leader, uh, to talk a little bit about this product, to try and take away some of the mystique that's there and uh, see what we can do with it. That doesn't really do anything. <laughs> oh, here we are. Okay, so this is just a, a general summary of the, of the products we have, so I do welcome for you to drop by our booth and we can talk a little bit more about some of the special uh, solutions. And right down at the bottom is the kidnap and ransom, and without further ado, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, and um, thank you all for attending the Kidnap and Manson presentation this morning. Good morning to you all. Um, as Mark said, my name is Mark Baker. I head up the Kidnap and Manson underwriting team at CFC Underwriting Limited over in London. I can imagine most of you have never heard of CFC. I haven't heard of them until I joined them four and a half years ago. Uh, the company was established in 1999, primarily as a cyber specialist insurer, uh, but they were a bit ahead of their time. Back then, no one, no one near as many people were interested in cyber insurance as they are these days. Uh, currently, CFC have got over 70,000 clients in more than 80 countries around the world. And in the last 12 months, we've underwritten just over half a billion US dollars in premium. But we're not just about cyber. Um, we do do other products too. We offer combined products that are geared uh, specifically for certain industries, such as financial institutions, healthcare, 
life sciences, media and entertainment, professional services and technology companies. But we also do standalone products uh, ranging from the traditional lines such as professional liability, management liability and property casualty uh, to some of the more niche products such as terrorism, product recall, intellectual property and contingency. So I thought I'd start today by maybe talking about some of the notable cases that have happened in Kidnap and Ransom over the uh, past 100 years or so, and how these cases have helped the development of the product as we know it today. So back in 1932, uh, five years after he became the first person to cross the Atlantic solo in an aircraft, Charles Lindbergh suffered the kidnap of his 20-month-old son from their second-floor nursery in their house in New Jersey. Upon search of the property, a broken ladder was found on the ground outside the nursery window, and a ransom uh, letter was found on the windowsill of the nursery, demanding $50,000 for the return of the boy. Now, over the next few weeks, contact was made with the kidnapper, and a meet was arranged. And at that meet, uh, Lindbergh handed over $50,000 in cash and was told that he could find his son hidden on a boat in a boatyard in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, when they searched that boatyard, uh, there was no sign of the boy. And sadly, a couple of months after the actual kidnapping itself, uh, the partly buried body of the boy was found in woodland not too far from the Lindbergh household. Um, and the post-mortem on the body uh, revealed that the boy had died from head trauma. So police believe that actually the ladder was broken as the kidnapper was climbing outside, uh, down from the window, and the boy had actually uh, died at the scene. A couple of things came out the back of this incident, really. First was the introduction of the Federal Kidnapping Act in the US, uh, which then allowed police to cross state lines when pursuing suspected kidnappers. And secondly, it saw Lloyd's underwriters offering the first kidnapper ransom policies. Uh, however, back then, all those policies were doing were covering just the reimbursement of any ransom paid. So in 1973, John Paul Getty III, who was the grandson of the then world's richest man, was kidnapped while on holiday in Rome with his friends. Now, the 16-year-old was a bit of a wild child, so when the family received a letter demanding a ransom for the boy's return, and demanding $17 million, they just dismissed it as a hoax being played by the son and his friends. It was only at a later stage when they received another letter um, with part of the boy's ear contained within it that they actually started taking it seriously. Um, so the grandfather negotiated with the kidnappers and does anyone have a, anyone want to have a guess at how much ransom was actually paid for the boy's return? There's no prizes. So. so eventually they agreed on a ransom of just under $3 million for the return of the boy. Uh, the money was paid, uh, the boy was returned safely, um, and the grandfather, being a notorious miser, uh, as soon as the boy was back, he demanded that his son uh, repay that $2.9 million in full, and not only that, but he also paid 4% interest on top. <laughs> and it's also been alleged that 2.9 was the most that was tax deductible, but we don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> and then finally, in 1974, Bank E. Bourne were one of the largest manufacturing companies in Argentina. Uh, the two sons of one of the owners, born, were kidnapped by the Monteneros, who were a left-wing guerrilla group operating in the country at that time, and they de demanded $10 million for the return of the two boys. Now, born, as any concerned parent would do, uh, immediately agreed to pay that amount of money to them, which was a mistake, because the kidnapped group then realised quite quickly that actually they're probably undervalued the value of those two boys, and upon receipt of that $10 million, they, they only returned one of the sons. And eventually, they had to pay an additional $50 million to get the second one back. This is what we call as a double ransom, and it was off the back of this incident that kin uh, kidnap and ransom insurers started offering the assistance of expert response consultants to help out companies and families in negotiations. Um, because obviously they weren't used to this type of scenario and to try and avoid such a similar incident happening again. <coughs> so we're just going to take a little look at some uh, kidnapping statistics that are based on the last 12 months. 
So there are around 10,000 reported kidnappings globally each year. However, we believe that due to reprisal, fear of reprisals, and also uh, concern that maybe local authorities in certain countries might be in some way involved in these kidnappings, that only around 20% of incidents are actually reported, which obviously then bumps the number up to around 50,000 kidnappings taking place around the world each year. And in the 12 months from July 2018 to June 2019, around 1,500 foreign nationals were kidnapped outside of their home country. Having a quick look at the current global hotspots for kidnapping. Um, in the last 12 months, 50% of all global kidnappings took place in the Americas, and I don't think anybody would be surprised to see that Mexico is heading up the top of that list, accounted for 85% of those actual kidnappings. Venezuela and Colombia, probably no surprise to be seen there as well, but I think you, a lot of people in this room would be surprised to see the USA coming in in fourth in that list. And part of that number is down to the, uh, the growing prevalence of virtual kidnappings that are taking place in the US at the moment, where there isn't actually kidnapping takes place, but you receive a call alleging that only your child or a family member has been kidnapped, you're told that you've got to stay on the line, and you've got to transfer some bitcoins or some money immediately to the kidnap group, uh, otherwise the family member will be harmed. Whereas in fact, actually the family member is probably just in the cinema or out with some friends and there's no actual kidnappings taking place. Africa accounted for about a fifth of the kidnappings, and again with Nigeria and Libya making up the bulk of those. I suppose the other surprising stat from this slide, really, considering what countries are based in this region, is the fact that only 5% of kidnappings take place in the Middle East. However, what you'll find is most of the time when the kidnappings do hit the media, it's kidnappings that have taken place in this region because they are politically motivated, rather than criminal gangs just kidnapping people for financial gain. So kidnapping outcomes, around 80% of kidnapped victims are released upon payment or suspected payment of a ransom. Only 6% are ever rescued, sadly 5.5% never make it home, and a very small percent, 2% actually escape from captivity. So I think this demonstrates that negotiation is by far the safest approach in a kidnap incident. Um, and it's also worth noting that actually fewer than 5% of actual reported kidnappings are insured incidents. So people are paying ransoms, whether there's a policy in place or not. Um, so why would you want to buy a kidnapping ransom policy? What does it give you? Well, obviously it provides reimbursement of any ransom that's been paid. And it's important to know that there is a policy of reimbursement. So... Um, your client has to have the means to be able to pay any negotiated ransom in the first instance before claiming back from insurers. Uh, we will reimburse any other expenses incurred, and we'll come on to those a bit later on. And probably just as important as protecting your balance sheet, uh, we will provide access to expert response consultants who will assist you all the, every step of the way in a kidnap incident. We've partnered up with two companies, uh, and that's them up there, SRM and EOS, EOS Risk. So what does a consultant do? Well, uh, when somebody purchases a kidnap and ransom policy, on that policy will be a 24-hour hotline number, which give, will give them direct access to the response consultant company. So we would always encourage our clients that as soon as they have an actual, or even just suspect they may have a kidnap incident, they call the response consultants as soon as possible. Those response consultants then will uh, gather as much information about the incident as they can, and then they'll be able to provide, depending on where in the world that this incident's taken place, they'll be able to provide objective advice as to what they feel that the client should do next. As soon as it becomes clear that it is an actual uh, kidnap incident, then a response consultant will deploy to the office or the home of uh, the kidnapped victim, and then they will draw together the crisis management team, if the company's got one, and they'll manage that incident uh, all the way through to uh, conclusion. The consultants will um, train up a communicator, so they'll help identify the best person within the company or the family 
to perform those negotiations with the kidnap group 